Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's very nice to be with you. Uh, what I plan to do today is to spend a little bit of time on our half year results through to the 31st of December 2022, and then spend some time focusing on the outlook for the business and our strategy. But just to start with the, the picture you can see there, that's 280 Bishopsgate right in the centre of London. That is a green uh, refurbishment uh, project that we completed uh, towards the back end of last year and a good example of the kind of capabilities we have uh, in the private sector. Uh, but probably if you move on to the next slide, please. So let me start with some headlines on the business and then I'll come back uh, to a little bit more detail on some of these items. So firstly, we're really pleased with our performance in the half year to the end of December. And you know, that absolutely is thanks to all of my colleagues up and down the country um, working hard day in, day out across all of our various uh, sites across, across the UK. Uh, what we're pleased about particularly is we delivered disciplined, controlled growth in both revenue and profit. Uh, we, uh, all, all of our businesses, all of our business units across the country are performing well, and in particular the acquisitions, and we've done three acquisitions in the last 18 months, and they're all settling in nicely and have really bolstered our capabilities uh, in the sector, particularly the environment and the water sector that we work in. I'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, despite, there was some delays um, last year in converting new projects into, into contracted sites that we could start on the ground, but despite that, we were able to increase our half-year profit before tax to 11.7 million pounds with an, uh, an operating margin of 2.3%. Our balance sheet stays uh, it remains very strong. Again, I'll come back to some more details on that in a moment. And we're continuing to progress against our various ESG commitments, which are fundamental to our strategy. They're in integrated into our strategic targets. Alongside that, yeah, we were able to declare an interim dividend of 3p. That's up from 2.2p in the same period last year. And, and as we look forward, the order book is robust. We've got a very strong pipeline. That gives us real confidence uh, in the outlook. And we're very confident in achieving our full year 2023 um, targets. So that's through to June 2023. And we increased our guidance to the market to the upper end of the range of analyst expectations. And actually, we've seen some of the analysts have upgraded their forecasts over the last week or so as a result. If we just move to the next slide, I just want to remind everybody or, or, or for those of you who are new to the business to introduce you to our investment proposition. So we are a high quality business. We operate in very robust market sectors and we are generating increasing returns for our shareholders. So just going through in a bit more detail, I think all of the markets that we operate in are very robust. They've remained very strong through this year. We see a really good uh, pipeline. That's really driven by continued strong levels of government investment. Um, and I'll come on to all of that in more detail when we talk about the outlook later on. Just as importantly, we've then got the right culture embedded in our business to deliver our strategy. That's a culture focused on risk management, focused on disciplined contract selection and contract delivery. And that culture is absolutely critical to the way that we want to uh, develop the business. We've got a very strong financial position. And on top of that, we're demonstrating an increasing track record of delivering consistent, predictable financial results. And that's really important. And we've got a clear strategy which will further deliver, uh, deliver and further enhanced shareholder returns. And so the combination of those four features, I think, makes this a really compelling uh, investment case. So if we just move on to the next th th this slide, so just going through the half year results in a little bit more detail. So you can see there that revenue is up 14 percent compared to the same six months um, of the previous year. Buildings revenue is up three and a half percent. You can see on the, the, the bar chart on the left hand bar chart, buildings revenue is up 3.5 percent. And our building business, which delivers schools and healthcare facilities and other public sector and private sector buildings, that business saw some delays to contract starts through 2022. Firstly, in relation to inflation, uh, it took longer to get contracts signed because of price increases at the start of 2022. And then later in 2022, the political kind of hiatus in the autumn did delay some contract starts as well. But we're seeing both of those two issues ease now. And despite that, we saw revenue in that part of the business grow by three and a half percent. 
in infrastructure, which deals with highways and water, so clean water and wastewater treatment centers, we saw revenue increase by 35%. And that was particularly driven by that environment business, the water business. And just so we're all clear, that includes the benefit of an acquisition that we did in October 2021, which delivered very little revenue in the equivalent period to December 2021. So that really helped bolster uh, the growth in revenues uh, in the last half year. More importantly than revenue, though, is the margin side on the right hand chart. So you can see that both building and infrastructure delivered increased margins, so margin progression along the lines of the targets that we set out, which I'll come on to in more detail when we go through the, the outlook. But that margin uh, progression is very important to us. Our pre-exceptional operating profit before amortization, that grew 57% to 10.8 million pounds. And that included a one-off 3.6 million pounds sale of an interest in a non-core debt joint venture business. We also reported four and a half million pounds of exceptional costs. And these relate entirely to an investment we're making in uh, cloud-based digital systems, which we have to take through as a, an annual charge, even though that system will support the business for the next 10 or more years going forwards. So our profit before tax, you can see 11.7 million pounds and our uh, tax rate increased to 19 and a half percent. That's just below the standard rate. Uh, that's higher than the previous year because we previously, the, the rate was lower due to some Brought forward tax losses. And altogether, put that all together, that means our earnings per share increased 49% compared to the same period last year to 8.8 .8 pence per share. If we move on to the next slide, you can see here the strong balance sheet that I referred to earlier on. And before I come into the balance sheet, uh, call out a couple of uh, points on the balance sheet, I just want to make the point that this strong balance sheet really helps us in the marketplace. It helps us attract good quality clients. So clients want to work with a contractor who will be there to deliver their project and if they've got confidence, it will be there to deliver their project. And similarly, it helps us work with the best in the supply chain because it gives the supply chain certainty that we can pay them and pay them properly and on time. We've got no debt in the business and we've got no pension liabilities either. So, so our balance sheet is very uh, straightforward and you can see that we've got a robust cash position. Our average month end cash was 154 million pounds with a period end cash of 196 million pounds. We think all good contractors should have net cash and you can see we have good cash position, strong and robust cash every single day of the year. And we also generated two million pounds of interest income through a combination of our cash balances and our PPP asset portfolio, which is worth 46 million pounds. The cash balances that you can see that they are lower than, than last year. And I want on the next slide just to come on to explain uh, why that is and explain the movements. So you can see here, this is the movement from our opening cash on the 1st of July through to closing cash at the end of December. And just going on the right hand side, you can see we invested four and a half million pounds in exceptional items. That's our investment in uh, our IT upgrades. We spent 10 million pounds on dividends and share buybacks, that's returns to shareholders. And the operating cash outflow in the period was a, was a small amount, three, three million pounds. And that was impacted by both some of the delayed contract starts that I referred to earlier, and also the acquisitions that we've made over the last 18 months and funding some of the liabilities that we acquired with those acquisitions. So there's good, there's good reasons why our cash has moved in the way it has done, but really importantly, we've continued to pay our supply chain promptly and on time. You can see the statistics on the right hand side. We pay 98% of our invoices within 60 days. We pay on average in 26 days. And for our small suppliers, those with less than 50 employees, we paid nearly 90% of invoices within 30 days. And that's really important for our supply chain because it helps them manage their own businesses. So this is one of the reasons that we are a contractor of choice for the best in the supply chain. So the balance sheet and the cash position, very, very important to the business overall. And on the next slide, you can see then how this comes together in our capital allocation policy. And we absolutely, First and foremost, main prioritize retaining that strong balance sheet. 
The strong balance sheet is a competitive advantage for us. As I've said, it gives confidence to our clients, to our supply chain. It helps us as well within the business to maintain that focus on discipline, on good quality contract selection, and just as importantly, uh, deselection to the contracts that we won't bid for. So that strong balance sheet, very important for the business. It also helps us to invest in the business, whether that be investing in our people, in quality, in digital assets, or whether that be investing in bolt-on acquisitions, which might enhance uh, the business's capabilities and accelerate progress towards our strategy. The, the strong balance sheet also gives us the confidence to be able to pay a sustainable and growing uh, dividend to our shareholders. And our dividend policy is set at a twice cover of earnings. So in other words, for every pound of, uh, of post-tax earnings, we pay 50p to our shareholders and we retain 50p in the business. And we've also said that where we see excess capital on the balance sheet, then we will return that to our shareholders in excess of the ordinary dividend. And there's currently a 15 million pound share buyback underway uh, in the business. So putting together, um, if you just move on to the next slide, you can put together the excellent performance in the half year, put together with the strong balance sheet and the confident outlook, which I'm about to come on to discuss. That gave us the confidence to declare an increased dividend of three pence per share uh, for the half year. That was 36% higher than the same period last year. And of course, importantly, as we continue to deliver our strategy, our strategy show it will demonstrate uh, revenue growth, and margin growth, which combined will lead to, to faster earnings growth and our dividends will continue to increase um, accordingly. So with that, I want to now just move on to think, think about the strategy and the outlook on the, so if we move to the next slide. I think the first place to start is the markets that we operate in, um, because we see really resilient markets in, in our marketplace. And these this really underpins the growth that we expect in our core and our adjacent and newer markets that we operate in. And we've got really strong positions across all the markets uh, that we operate in. I'll, I'll come on to these later on in more detail, but these markets include education. So we're typically building 30 or 40 schools across the country at any one time. It includes healthcare, which is building bolt-on healthcare facilities uh, to, to, for, for the NHS. It includes clean water and wastewater treatment works. It includes local authority and national highways, highways projects. And importantly, the drivers of growth in all of these markets are there and they're strong because the UK government's continuing to invest in the UK's social and economic infrastructure. And we see all of those sectors are requiring further investment, whether it's to support demographic changes, whether it's to support the replenishment and the uh, and refurbishment of the UK's built environment, and whether it's about digitalization and increasing the UK's productivity. So we see a really good pipeline driven by those fundamentals. Increasingly as well, we're able to support our clients' objectives to reduce their carbon footprint. This is an increasingly important route to market in terms of uh, constructing the built environment, which is more energy and carbon efficient than that which went before. So this is a really important uh, route for us that we can demonstrate that our credentials in decarbonisation. And we are seeing improving macroeconomic conditions. We're seeing uh, inflation starting to ease. We're seeing materials availability um, easing. And of course, we do have contractual protections in place and proactive relationships with our clients and our supply chain to manage those conditions as well. So with that in mind, if we just move on to the next slide, um, I just want to kind of deal up front, I suppose, with some of the challenges that we saw through 2022. You know, we live in the real world. We're not immune to uh, what's happening in the real world. But the challenges we saw during calendar year 2022, we were able to respond to those, we were able to manage those. And importantly, they had no overall impact uh, on our financial performance in the period. So if I take, for, uh, for example, inflation, uh, we did see a spike in inflation about this time last year. That uh, did lead to some delay in signing new contracts because we were very clear that we would maintain our attitude to risk and to price, you know, make sure we were continuing to price contracts sensibly, making sure we had the right contractual protections in against further inflation. And what that meant was that sometimes prices of a contract, if you were planning to build a £20 million primary school, which was now £23 million, actually the clients had to go away and look to either get the additional budget or perhaps value engineer 
some parts of the design. And importantly, we retained our discipline. And that's why it took a little bit longer to get contracts signed when inflation first started to become a feature uh, this time last year. Materials availability, you can see on the slide again, that was an issue uh, about this time last year, but that's really eased and that's generally no longer uh, an issue for us. But we've retained those disciplines of early planning and procuring materials early to make sure that our programs are, are all protected from any delays that may arise. Uh, I've put skills shortages on there. We all know about the, the labour market in the UK is, uh, is very tight at the moment. So important for us is about retaining our excellent people, helping our existing employees to develop themselves, develop their careers within Gallifrey Tri, as well as attracting good new people to the business. So those are really important parts uh, of our strategy. We invest very heavily in that in terms of our time and our energies. And you can see we've got a very stable churn rate there, 11.7%. And in fact, that is lower if you exclude the acquisitions that we made in the period. So the acquisitions we took on slightly uh, increase uh, that headline employee churn rate. But even so, that churn rate is probably half of the construction industry average. So it's a very good place for us to be. And just as importantly, uh, we invest heavily in early careers. So these are apprentices, trainees, graduates, and that uh, represents 6.3% of our overall uh, uh, population of employees. We, we, we take on around about 150 uh, new people each year into those, into those career programs. You know, we, we, uh, we made a cost of living payment in the autumn uh, of about a million pounds, to uh, which went to uh, about half of our people. We early adopted the increase in, uh, in the real living wage uh, in November last year as well. So investing in our people is a real core part of delivering uh, our strategy. So I wanted, I wanted to put that slide up there to demonstrate, you know, there were challenges during the calendar year 2022, but so those challenges, we were able to manage those and the outcome has not, um, uh, has not been to the detriment of the financial performance of the business. So hopefully that's a useful backdrop to, to 2022 and the market outlook and gives us a bit of context for the strategy of the business. So if you move on to the next slide, please. So our strategy uh, we call sustainable growth strategy. And it's very simply to deliver high quality buildings and infrastructure, to deliver that in a socially responsible way and to deliver that in a way which provides a sustainable return for our shareholders. And you can see the cornerstones of the strategy there. We focus initially on uh, being a people-orientated, progressive business. That's making sure that everybody in the business goes home safely at the end of the day. It's making sure that we invest in our people, invest in uh, our careers programs. I spent this morning uh, talking to a cohort of people on our, our senior leadership program. We invest heavily uh, in our, in our uh, careers development for our people, as I referred to earlier on. The second quadrant there is about socially responsible delivery. So making sure we deliver in a way which protects our environments and, and the communities that we live in. So this involves things like social value, uh, measuring social value. So social value includes all sorts of uh, things such as employing local people, local supply chain to all of our uh, projects. It's about looking at uh, reducing carbon, our carbon footprint, increasing uh, biodiversity. So the whole piece around socially responsible delivery is important for our people, it's important for the business, and it's important for our clients. We want to deliver excellence, and that includes a real culture of quality, a focus on delivering quality to our clients uh, across the piece. It involves digital investment, working closely with our supply chain, paying our supply chain uh, promptly, and so on. And if we get these three quadrants right, then we will deliver sustainable, predictable, growing financial returns for our shareholders, and we're starting to build that track record of doing just that. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, this slide demonstrates what our strategy will deliver, and our strategy goes out through to 2026. So our targets for 2026 are to increase our revenue to £1.6 billion because the markets are there to support that revenue growth, and more importantly, to increase our operating margin to 3%, and we're making good progress against both of those uh, targets. So the way that we're going to uh, deliver these targets on the left hand side there is growing in uh, existing markets, in building, in highways and environment. We'll be growing there through the framework positions that we already have in, in uh, with our clients, through the quality of the order book, which I'll come on to in a moment. Uh, and all of those markets are performing well for us at the moment and there's good growth potential 
in, in each of those markets. And allied to that, we are looking to grow in three higher margin adjacent markets. So these are the private rented sector, where we already do a lot of work constructing private rented schemes, and we're moving into the development phase of those private rented schemes. To look at the green retrofit of existing buildings, and we see this as a huge market opportunity that the UK built environment needs to improve its energy efficiency, and we see good opportunity for us to do that, whether it's from uh, small scale interventions through our facilities management business, right through to, 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 to developing big refurbishments, such as the Bishopsgate example on the front cover, which I talked about at the start. And our third adjacent market is, is moving our environment water business into the capital maintenance and asset optimization part of water. So as well as doing the design, build and construction and commissioning of new water and wastewater treatment works, it's also then looking to help with the maintenance and ongoing capital maintenance of those same treatment works. So I would say of those adjacent markets, the PRS sector, we did see some hiatus uh, in, this, in the autumn following the mini budget. That's starting to, um, starting to write itself again now, but that will probably uh, come back to, to normal over the course of the next six months or so. The green retrofit market is commencing. That's a huge market uh, that we're starting to work in. And we're making really good progress in that capital maintenance part of our strategy, partly through the three acquisitions that we've done uh, over the last 18 months. Importantly, all of these strategic targets are underpinned by our sustainability commitments. So just to pick a couple of the examples on the screen there, you can see the Clear the Shored uh, award that we received. That's for uh, diversity and inclusivity in the workplace. You can see on the right hand side there, we were named as uh, contractor of the year in the water sector uh, last year. And in the middle there, we sit on the UK Net Zero Carbon Building Standards Board, which is about developing the new Net Zero Carbon Building Standards for the UK. So. Our approach to sustainability absolutely underpins uh, our strategy across the piece. But really importantly, everybody, really importantly, we're only going to grow the business where we can grow it in line with our risk appetite to make sure that we grow it successfully and in a way which enhances our margin. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, so you can see here, it's very important that our focus on risk management is embedded through the business, which it is. It's embedded through our culture in the business, and we absolutely are growing the business with this as the backdrop. So we've got aligned culture from right the way from uh, the southwest of England right up to the highlands of Scotland. Our incentives across the business are all aligned. So there are the incentives in the business are around profit and cash and ESG. There's nobody in the business who's incentivized on turnover. The important thing is that we have a real understanding through the business of risk and making sure we find contractual mechanisms to manage uh, that risk and making sure that no individual job is significant enough or is risky that would undermine what we're doing across the rest of the business. So you can see there in the, on the top row in the middle box there, every single project, which is over 25 million pounds, would come to the executive board for approval. But more importantly, every single project of whatever size, if it's risk, uh, criteria don't meet our normal, cri uh, normal criteria that would come to the executive board for discussion and review and approval as well. So for those of you who've seen a presentation from me before, I make no apologies in a way for, for re-showing re re this slide. This focus on risk management is absolutely front and centre to everything that we're looking to do. So then if we just move on to the next slide, what uh, quality people, the focus on culture and the discipline around risk, what that leads to is a really high quality order book. Our order book at the end of December was 3.5 billion pounds. And you can see uh, the split of the order book on the left hand side there by, by sector. And every single contract in that order book has come through the risk process that I've just talked to. Everything in that order book supports our strategy and supports our margin uh, aspirations. And maybe just to call out a couple of uh, a, a couple of things on the slide here, you can see that. 80% uh, 80 um, 80 of the, the uh, work in the order book there is, uh, is secured for 2024. So that's for the year through to uh, June 2024. And we've probably got around about 60% secured already for the year through to June 2025. You can see nearly 87% well, of that is in frameworks. Frameworks give us 
long-term high quality work with established terms and conditions with known clients that's an excellent route to market for us and you can see that generally speaking the, the split between public sector and private sector is somewhere between 80 20 and and uh, and, and, and and 90 10 but importantly all that private sector work goes through exactly the same risk management process so it's equally as high quality as the public sector piece so so that order book is really strong really uh, really high quality and provides us really good confidence um, as we as we look forward uh, if we just move on to the next slide please you can see here these are just some uh, examples of the framework uh, frameworks that we are uh, members of these frameworks are really good routes to market for us uh, for all the reasons that i've just uh, set out and it really underpins that culture and that focus on uh, on risk management so this is a really important part of our strategy and our route to market so putting all of that together uh, on the next slide, slide just to summarize the group is in a really good position we had a very good half year through to december 2022 we've got a strong outlook and a confident outlook to june 2023 and beyond to our 2026 targets we're progressing against those targets and importantly we're doing and delivering exactly what we said we'd do building that track record of sustainable consistent predictable performance we're financially very strong we're operating in robust and growing markets and all of that comes together to provide increasing shareholder returns so all in all yeah you know, we're very pleased with our with our performance and our performance against our strategy and so what I'll do there is to pause and then I'll hand over to Mike and we'll take some Q&A. Thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, that was all fairly loud and clear. So excellent. Um, just a reminder to the audience, do start typing away in the question box and uh, having a look at what other questions are coming in as well. Um, well, we've only got one in the box at the moment, um, but um, it's about the net cash that you mentioned on the balance sheet and what proportion of that is really uh, advanced payments from clients that presumably is going uh, probably straight out again or very shortly to your suppliers as part of a project and what proportion is, uh, is there for you to keep as it were? Yeah, no, so that's, so that's all I cash. I mean, typically about 20 million of that would be in project bank accounts or, or joint venture accounts, which is which is linked to individual projects. But the, but the cash balance stays, you know, in a range, you know, every day of the year, we've got a strong, robust cash. I look at the cash balances every single day, as you would, as you would probably expect. Yeah. And I, and I think uh, the, the difference might to, obviously, we try and manage to make sure we get paid timely from all of our clients, but equally, we pay our supply chain uh, on a timely basis. And I think probably the, the background to this question is in the past, construction companies, A, didn't pay their supply chain on, on a timely basis. That's that's dealt with. But also what they would typically do is get large upfront cash uh, payments. So if I was starting a, a, a particular project, I would get paid a huge slug of that cash on day one, and then that would unwind over time. We see that a lot less. That's very, very rare these days. So of course, we want to make sure we get good a prompt payment from our clients but our client payments are on a monthly basis as opposed to big significant advance payments yeah you know, which it was more of a feature you know sort of in the in, in the past in construction okay i don't know what your trade um creditors are generally on the balance sheet what's the what level is your trade yeah so, so so we have net negative working capital and, and that is how i'd expect most construction companies with with net cash to be so you end up with with with, with a credit yeah. and, and, and a contract liabilities position and that's yeah that, and that's the sort of normal piece but i think that the point is it's a it's a kind of it, it's a it's a it's, it's not because of you know big payments at the start of a contract which you're then unwinding this is about the normal sort of monthly working capital cycle in the business okay okay thank you thank you um are, are you seeing any changes in that regard you've talked about the payments from clients as is more of a phased and lump sum in advance as it were um given the the situation with inflation and what we've been through over the last year or so has that changed significantly in the way that those are negotiated and agreed in contracts? It's, it's not really changed the the uh, cash flow position. I, th I think what inflation did was to change the uh, pricing uh, point at the start of contracts. So, uh, so we would always uh, include in you know, in contracts a risk allowance for future inflation, but 
But of course, when we're pricing a contract, you know, we price it based on a buildup of quotes from our supply chain. And one yeah. of the issues we saw last year, Mike, when, when inflation started was the supply chain had real uncertainty about future pricing. So they would not be able to give us a, an extended quote because they didn't have the certainty of their own cost base. And that caused a real problem in terms of um, then we had to, you know, we couldn't quote and, 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 give, and give a long term quote for it to our clients. And then and, and, and so and so it kind of caused a bit of a hiatus in, 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 in the process. What yeah. we're seeing now is inflation has certainly settled down, and we're now, you know, we're now able to give quotes which are backed by our supply chain for length of time, which gives our clients time to look at those and go through approval processes. Now, and and I think it's also worth saying in our, for example, in our infrastructure business, all of our projects there are on a target cost cost reimbursable basis. So what that means is, rather than a fixed price at the start of a contract, you agree a target price that you'll work towards. And if we go over the target price, maybe because of inflation, then that, that excess is shared with the client. And if we deliver below the target price, then that upside is shared with the client. And what that creates is a real uh, commonality in terms of outlook and incentive between us and the client to make sure we work together to, to really manage these issues. So, so it's a really collaborative client behaviors now. And, and in fact, most of our work is, is awarded on a quality basis so again this is about most work now is not awarded on a lowest price wins basis um so again if in fact if we if we get a job through the door which is lowest price wins you know first bid on the nose we wouldn't we wouldn't bid for it because it doesn't meet our risk uh, criteria most of our work is awarded now based on quality so you get awarded quality based on things like your balance sheet strength things like uh, things like your people your track record your social value maybe 80% of the points are awarded on quality and 20% based on price and commercial terms. And that allows you to be awarded contracts based on quality, and then you can negotiate the price based on a, a joint design with the client. So, so I think the market um, overall, I know I'm sort of moving on a little bit from your direct question, but the market is much more mature mm. in the way that our clients are procuring. And that's really good for us because that means yeah, that's much more aligned to our risk appetite and allows us to grow that order book in a way which is, you know, it's a much better way to address things like you know, inflation, to address challenges in projects is when you're working with that mature uh, uh, client body as well. Right. OK, thank you. So, the, I mean, the vast majority of work is in these framework uh, agreements. And so uh, would that be, are they all pretty typical of the explanation you just gave us? They all kind of work along those lines of uh, sort of gain sharing or pain sharing yeah, depending so, on the so outcomes? So, so, so in infrastructure, all gain sharing and pain sharing in building, perhaps less so, but but still very focused on quality rather than price. So, yeah, um, and, and yeah, and I think this is one of the uh, one of the changes in the construction market over the last three or four years. We've really seen this move to quality procurement by our clients, and yeah, and I think it's probably an area which the uh, investor base is not has not all fully appreciated the importance of that in terms of you know, what that means for us is that ability to deliver that consistent and predictable performance because you know that you're working with the you know, high quality clients who are you know, who are focused on value and focused on outcomes. So. Is that a, a, one, what's driving the clients in that direction in your view? So, so a couple of things. So in the public sector, the, the government published in the autumn of 2020 something that they call the, the construction playbook. Uh, to, to a degree, this was a response to Carillion, um, you know, in terms of construct, uh, government wanting to procure for best value. It's that construction playbook, though, is the is a sort of son of, you know, lots of previous reports talking about how the government should uh, procure construction services. But that was the first real tangible process. And we are seeing traction of that through uh, government bodies and through the frameworks that they, they have. But I also think our private sector clients are also in a similar mindset and you know we, we've got a job we've just completed uh, which was for a private sector client where we were asked to come and negotiate with that client one-on-one -on -one because of the strength of our balance sheet we've got another private sector job we're just starting which is with a repeat client because again it's about behaviors and about relationships so i think the private sector is also looking to procure on that more mature basis but i do think you know carillion really was a watershed moment in the way that certainly the public sector procures construction services.
Mm, in a funny sort of way, they did you some favours, I guess. In, uh, yeah, I mean, there was lots of, you know, don't, don't get me wrong, it's not great when, you know, that's no. a corporate failure, but, but it did, I think the penny did drop a little bit around, um, yeah. around actually procuring for best value, you know, not just lowest cost is really important. Yes, yes. Um, just a, a quick one here. Congratulations on maintaining your margins in a difficult year. Um, Nonetheless, your margin is very small. So how do you protect against unexpected hiccups? Yeah, so, so it's a good question. And so the first, the first thing is comes back to risk management, risk awareness, and what we bid. So making sure that you only take on contracts which are supportive of the margin, make sure you've got the right contractual protections in there. You're only pricing uh, risks that you can price and, and not things which you, you know, which, which you don't understand. You leave those risks with the client or you price them on a provisional sum. So first and foremost, what you take into the order book, absolutely critical. And there's nothing in our order book uh, which doesn't meet our risk criteria. And then I think the other thing is having that portfolio of contracts. You end up with this portfolio effect, not, not dissimilar to um, the, probably the investors on the call. So so in our building business, our median contract is about 20 million pounds. So what that means is we don't have individual contracts which are so big that they distort the portfolio. And if something goes a little bit wrong, it takes it takes you out of the knee. So when I, I, I when I run the kind of graph of performance of contracts, there's a handful of contracts which are performing a little bit worse than we were hoping. And there's a handful performing a little bit better than we expect, but they kind of net each other off. And importantly, there's nothing in there which is individually significant which wipes the wipes everything out so you know as i say I'm, I'm sure a similar strategy in a way to how many people look at their own sort of investment portfolio it's about having that portfolio effect but having and then having the sort of focus on quality that culture of quality lots of focus on digital uh, support for the business in terms of quality in terms of record keeping you know and then as we drive that margin forward you know, then obviously yeah that that starts to improve and we're, we're, we are increasing that margin um, you asked the question I said. Yes, yeah, you mentioned 3% uh, on your yeah. slide pack. What's a reasonable medium term target for you, given the nature of your business? Yeah, so so there's not that many businesses consistently doing 3% yet. So, you know, we're very happy that that's our first target, you know, and that we're making good progress towards it. But equally, what we've said is, you know, that, you know, that is a way, way marker. So as we get close to that target, then, of course, we'll then we'll then push that on. The reason we set three percent was a couple of reasons. You know, from two, we were at two percent when we set that, so it was a good fifty percent increase on the margin. So it was ambitious, but it was absolutely achievable. We could see the route path to it. We could see that through the order book, and so we wanted to set a margin target which was ambitious but achievable and realistic. And then say, as we get close to that, then we're very happy to to push that on. But you know, we can absolutely, you know, we want to make sure that we are able to demonstrate. That we can deliver the targets that we've set. So you know, we think you know, that three percent is a good sustainable baseline that we can get to, and then we'll you know, we'll look to push that on at the right time. Oh, okay, not brave enough to give me a number just yet. <laughs> okay, um, can you talk about uh, the competition and international firms that are expanding into the UK and how that might be impacting on on your business? Yeah. So, so in terms of competition, so I'd say actually I was talking about the market and client procurement. I've talked a lot about our own risk appetite. I would say most of the other tier one contractors, um, the names that you would recognize, are similarly focused on risk at the moment. And of course, you know, I'd say that we've got, you know, it's about how embedded and how ingrained that is. Of course it is. But but I think it's helpful that they are similarly focused on risk. Again, in that post Krulian world, I think everybody sort of understands the importance of that. So I think from that perspective, it's helpful that what that what that means is is that you don't have people really kind of going out with crazy pricing and jobs. And frankly, if they do, they can they can they can take them and they can deal with the consequences. But but I think generally speaking, the peer group has also got a similar attitude to risk. So I think that's I think that's probably helpful. I think you know, we do see international competition, but really more at the really larger, really big sort of mega infrastructure space rather than. Yeah, we don't really come across them on our on, on the sort of bids that we typically will be uh, will be operating on. And then I think the final thing I'd probably say is that the some of the focus on quality that I referred to earlier, which includes things like ability to uh, focus on social value and low carbon and and quality of track record, that probably also then creates a bit more barrier to entry, which in a way is good because you know that's you know the other big tier ones you know, would be able to achieve that, but but I think that does create some. Uh, some barriers to entry, which, which again are good for us and good for our margin uh, ambitions. 
Do you see competition wising up on that though? You may have got a bit of stolen a bit out of a march on some some of the competition so far in that is that sustainable or are they going well, to close in due, that in due gap? course of course every, you know, everybody w w will get there but i think different parts of the market are further ahead than others so in terms of their mm. focus on low carbon and, and so on so we see different for our different client bodies we see some you know accelerated further and, and and some less so 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 of course that that that, that will change and evolve over time but i think uh, yeah but we are building that track record so i think you know as i say i think it's also important that those other two ones are focused on risk and focused on, you know, as well, you know, yeah, yeah. making the right contracts at the right prices. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. And where do you, just sticking on the decarbonisation one for, for a second there, um, you, you talked about the industry generally is working quite hard on that. You're part of that committee and so on. What, where are the biggest challenges in terms of decarbonisation uh, looking over the next three, four, five years from your perspective? Where's the pressure going to come? Yeah, so we've got we we have got a couple of hours left, haven't we? On the uh, on, on well, the yeah. If you could give me the so, give me the, the one minute so, version. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I mean, well, this is a huge, it's a huge agenda, and it's a huge opportunity as well. So, what we're focused on is in the first. So, so I'm, I'm just kind of going to break it down, Mike, for you, perhaps into three uh, sections, if you like. So. So in terms of our overall carbon footprint, the first thing that we're looking at doing and we're making really good strides on is reducing our own operational carbon as a business. So something like 60% of our uh, fleet now is either fully electric or plug-in hybrid. You know, nobody in the business is allowed to order petrol, diesel, anything like that anymore. You know, in car fleet, all of our offices, uh, you know, where, where possible, are run off uh, renewable energy tariffs. You know, we try and make sure that our building sites are connecting to the, na the national grid as soon as possible to avoid using diesel generators as quickly as possible. We, we're using site cabins, which are now better insulated, means they're you know, more, more energy efficient. So there's all sorts of operational activities that we can do, which we're making huge strides on. The second, the second stage is probably what I'd call, call the uh, operational carbon in the, in the built environment. So we're now building schools, for example, if I take schools, the schools that we build now are probably something like 60% more efficient, so lower carbon footprint in use, so the operational carbon in use, than they were just five years ago. So huge strides in terms of, and that's through design, it's through technology, it's through heating ventilation systems, it's about the glazing, it's about the, the thermal insulation on the buildings, sometimes it's about even just the orientation of the building to make sure that they're maximising yeah, the sort of sunlight and, and whatever it might be. So, so the operational carbon footprint of buildings we're building now is, is, is hugely improved. And we're spending a lot of time in seeing more buildings needing you know, air source heat pumps. Again, you go back to Bishopsgate, that was all about taking out the insides, changing all the heating and ventilation, putting air source heat pumps on the roof to make the, that building much more energy efficient in use. So across the piece, that at the moment is really where the biggest focus is, is about making the the, the, the um, and of course we're working with our clients. We can't do this without our clients wanting this and without the supply chain to help deliver it. So I'm not pretending we can do this on our own. But at the moment, the real focus is on that operational carbon. The, the then the big challenge, and that and that's that's the here and now. The big challenge, of course, over the next I'm going to say 10 years, 15 years or so, is then of course also around the embodied carbon. So the sort of real cradle to grave piece around the reuse of materials about low carbon concrete, low carbon materials, and so on and so forth. And already you're seeing your discussion around whether buildings should be kind of gutted, but the frame retained, or whether you should raise you know, buildings to the ground. But you know, what does that mean in terms of carbon footprint and the use of buildings going forward? So, so if you like, yeah, we can do our own operational part first. We're working on the in-use carbon footprint of, of, of buildings. And then the, the embodied carbon is, is probably the biggest part of the challenge. But okay. and again, yeah, some of our clients are further ahead on this in terms of what they're wanting. And we'll we see, you know, we can't design a low carbon building for a client who doesn't want to pay for it. So it's about working hand in glove with our clients, of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you didn't go into the longer version. <laughs> um, bidding for major contracts, that's always a costly exercise. How do you pre-qualify tender opportunities before bidding? And what <laughs> rate of success do you aim to achieve when you are bidding, i.e. what percentage? Yeah, 
So it depends what you mean by major contracts, but we, we typically won't do the ma major mega schemes uh, at all, uh, is the first answer. You know, as I said earlier, nearly 90% of what we do is through frameworks. So the 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 bidding cost to get you onto a framework, and then the framework effectively it, you know, it doesn't give you a guaranteed pipeline, but it means that the bidding costs on the individual projects under that framework are much lower because you've pre-qualified on a lot of the criteria you've you've reworked, you already worked through some of the established terms and conditions. Yeah. But you know, we we don't you know anymore do the sort of individual fixed price or risk transfer major infrastructure projects. We just we just don't do those anymore. All of our environment businesses through frameworks, you know, all of our highways businesses through frameworks with either national highways or with local authorities. So yeah, and and yeah, the frameworks are very important to us, but it does also make the bidding process much more efficient because you aren't you're bidding on a single win or lose project, which you know, and then and then you're right, you know, your question is quite right. The cost can be very, very high and it becomes a binary win or lose. And so that's yeah, that's not really our route to market. Right. Okay, thank you. Um just on you you've mentioned uh, several times you don't really get involved in the major projects the mega projects what would be the biggest size project that galliford tribe would be comfortable with in terms of total cost sure so 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 it varies between the three you know, the three businesses so so in building our median size is 20 million pounds our single biggest job at the moment is 105 million pounds uh, that's coming towards the end actually um and but there is a chart on our on our uh, website with the distribution code. We are very you know we, we we're not scared of those big projects, but we have a relatively thin tail of them. You know, and and the big bulk of the building jobs are uh, are smaller. And and typically, we'd make sure that a single business unit, regional business unit in building, doesn't isn't overexposed to those you know to 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 to, to individual too many individually large uh, jobs. And of course, you know, so so that'd be in building in water. The jobs are typically much smaller I mean, they might range from a few hundred thousand pounds up to uh, low tens of millions of pounds in highways actually the headline prices can be bigger highways might range from sort of 30 million up to the kind of 130 150 million pound jobs but in highways of course those are all on target cost cost reimbursable uh, forms of contracts so so it's slightly different in the different parts of the business but 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 so too is the um is the contracting mechanism Okay, so roughly, roughly at any given time, how many live projects would you would Galliford try have a cost a piece as a just yeah, a, so so scale? so probably three hundred plus um, three hundred plus those in, so probably in building 100, 120, 150, something like that. In highways, it would be uh, you know, you know, I don't know, sort of forty, fifty, and in water, there could be a lot, but of of individually smaller value. So right, okay, probably something Thank like you. that altogether. Thank you. I read uh, recently that you uh, you've got a claim against a, a, a customer, a previous customer of around ninety five million, uh, rumbling through the legal process at the moment. Um, that's quite a big ticket item. Uh, well, uh, I, I'm sure you don't want to share every twist and turn with me, and there's all sorts of legal privilege over it. But uh, can you tell me what you've got that in at the, on the balance sheet for at the moment? Uh, so yeah, so what I can tell you on that, so, so you're quite right. So this is a claim against a, a, a client. This is on a job where we've uh, left site, finished on site in 2018. So to give you an idea, yes, yeah, so it's been been around for a while. The reason that's important is that this is not a job where we're continuing to, you know, incur costs trying to finish off uh, the construction project. So this is a a job where uh, this is a claim which is about cost recovery uh, for us. So this is about um, about recovery of of monies which have been long since uh, spent, um, I, I can't tell you exactly what's on the balance sheet, Mike. That is um, that, that, that that is privileged confidential, you know. But that claim, you know, is continuing, it's progressing along the the timetable we expect uh, expected, and I'm afraid the legal process is is torturously slow. Um, but that that continues to to progress as you know, as expected. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Andrew. Uh, we seem to be all out of questions. Just a reminder to anybody out there who uh, wants to ask a question. It's your last chance to ask Andrew while you've got his attention. Uh, this could be the last chance for another year. So um, if you uh, if you want to type away now, but um, uh, give you a minute. Uh, otherwise, we'll we'll close. Um, so I think, uh, you know, 
covered a great deal of uh, topics there, Andrew. Thank you for that. And uh, I'm a lot more clued up now on Gulliford Try than I was an hour ago. So thank you. Good, well, that's thank the you idea. Very, thank you very much for that.